This season of life is also called the wisdom years I like that. Grace to respect my elders it would be wiser for me and maybe a better deal for you if I just quit talking and come sit quietly with some of you, my elders, and listen to you share your heart on wisdom. At every stage of life, we need companions on the way, a community to belong to. We are hardwired for a relationship, not isolation. I would say that a significant part of what it means to be created in the image of God is that we are made to live in relationship and in community, in a common community with others. The word companion comes from the Latin, so I never said Latin, so this is hearsay. It comes from the Latin meaning with bread. So you can think Spanish con pan. So our companions on this journey are those with whom we break bread. We are not created for aloneness, but for community. We are made to live as a part of and not apart from. Having been church priest for many, too many aging people, being in community can be part of it. Loneliness and isolation are debilitating their Jesus. Community, family, friends, classmates, teammates, co-workers, is simply a given for most of our lives. It seems it just comes to us. And most of us live in a network of relationships. Until we reach this time in our lives. And now when our need for companions or community is perhaps most strongly felt, it seems more elusive. We have to work a little harder to find that community, become more intentional, to broaden our opportunities for companionship. Maybe we need to change some habits. Maybe we need to practice being a little less picky, a little less judgy, as the youngsters say. Try being a little more humble and patient and kind, so that as we seek out companions, maybe we find people who are looking for people like us. In this season when many of the people, things, and busyness that have shaped our identities are changing or are simply gone, we need a community to help us with our identity, to help us redefine what a meaningful life looks like. Not long after I was asked to speak today, I was driving somewhere, left turn blinker on for no particular reason, listening to the radio when a story came on about aging. So I did what all of us do. I issued a voice command to my in-dash computer via Bluetooth to record the story and send it to my iPad so that an AI generated summary could be accessed to prepare a PowerPoint to be used today. <laughs> Of course, I didn't do that. I pulled over into the parking lot as soon as I could and searched for a scrap of paper so that I could capture as much of this uh, report on the radio as I could. Here's what I got. According to a recent Stanford University study, people do not age at a steady pace like the picking of a clock. Instead, we go through periods when we age more slowly and periods when we age more quickly. Now, you might think, as I first thought, that they were talking about aging happening rapidly like when your kids are teenagers, or you invite your eight-year-old grandchild to have a sleepover at your house, or you're trying to enroll in Medicare, get old in a hurry. <laughs> but then this, this, according to the report, is a biological thing. So the study said that we age most rapidly when we're 44, and then again when we're 60. So, congratulations. The good news is that almost all of us have stopped aging. <laughs> no time for a bit that. We'll hardly notice it happening anymore. If a bunch of 20-something West Coast grad students do research and old people can be trusted in Massachusetts. I'm pretty much a Gulf Coast guy, but here's some news from the East Coast. A report from Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences. I have no idea what that means. 
But the report is called Six Domains of Human Flourishing. Six Domains of Human Flourishing. While what I read wasn't specifically about this third age of our lives, I do think it speaks to us who are making adjustments, reprioritizing, trying to make sense of our life today and what lies ahead. What is happening now in our lives. The report describes six areas that are vital experiencing your life as flourishing. The six domains are in no particular order. Happiness and life satisfaction, financial and material stability, close social relationships, mental and physical health, character and virtue, meaning and purpose. We could all probably come up with a few more domains that would be vital to us. Maybe safety and security, opportunities for learning, enjoyable hobbies, habits of worship and prayer, Cowboys speaking that wouldn't be awful. <laughs> but I think the hard to report six domains capture much of what we need, what we seek to live well and flourish during our wisdom years. I think those six also describe the kind of community that Morningside Ministry strives to build and to offer. I was, was not asked to make a pitch for Morningside, and I don't think I need to with so many of you who are part of Morningside. But I do believe that Morningside Ministry is committed to fostering a community, a ministry that supports human flourishing so that residents, families, and staff can live as fully as possible in those six domains. Stability, happiness, close relationships, mental and physical health, strengthening of character and the practice of virtue, and seeking meaning and purpose in these latter years. The Morningside Mission Statement is essentially a summary of the six domains. It reads, the faith-based mission of Morningside Ministries is to enhance the dignity and quality of life of older adults, their families, and team members with compassionate care. Dignity and quality of life are enhanced in relationships and communities that provide stability, that support mental and physical health, that cultivate opportunities for happiness and close relationships, that encourage the practice of virtue, and invite reflection on a person's meaning and purpose. As you've heard, Morningside has been in this for more than 60 years. Established in 1961, Morningside Manor was the first private faith-based residence for older adults in San Antonio. The ecumenical movement was strong within American Christianity at that time, and one happy result locally was the Spirit brought together, as we heard, First Presbyterian Church, the Southwest Texas Conference, the United Methodist Church, and the Episcopal Diocese of West Texas to create this new ministry. In 1961, the life expectancy for men was 67 years. For women, it was 73 and a half. I don't know if anyone involved in creating this place back then knew how long-term care, how long that would become, or how old age would lengthen, or how complicated everything about healthcare and aging would become. Currently, life expectancy for men is about 75 years, and for women, it's a little over 80. Part of the wisdom of the wisdom years, though, is that quality of life become spiritually desired far more than quantity of years. Through all of the changes and revolutions in our culture and in our senior population since 1961, Morningside seems to held true to its mission. Faith-based, enhancing the dignity and quality of life, compassionate care. Organization has moved and continues to move from an institutionalized institution, if that makes sense, to a residential community for the whole continuum and fullness of life during this third age of our lives. And the greenhouses that Pat just let us celebrate with him are a further step in that direction. 
I remember my mom taking me, dragging me when I was a kid to visit my grandmother's friends in a nursing home. And how terrified I was of the sounds and smells and sights. As a parish priest, I visited parishioners in plenty of nursing homes that weren't much improved from my first experiences. Morningside stands and has always stood against that tide of institutionalizing and warehousing those who have inconveniently gotten old. Why? Why do this? Because we, and I'll use we here proudly, we are faith based because we are pledged to dignity and quality of life, because we practice compassionate care. I can't speak for our Presbyterian and Methodist brothers and sisters. What the heck, I'm a speaker, so yes I can. So speaking for all of us, what is the faith that Morningside is based on? It is the faith that holds as true that God is creator of all it is, and he has called his creation good. He has called human beings, the crown of his creation, very good. And he has made us in his own image. Therefore, your life is precious to God, and you have worth and dignity and value simply because you are. This love Love is not dependent on how productive you are or how influential or plugged in or good looking or wealthy you are. It's faith that says we are to love God and our neighbors as we love ourselves. It's a faith based in the reality that we all sin and fall short of the kingdom of the life that God intends for us. It's a faith that says God has not abandoned us ever, and his grace and mercy stubbornly abide. It's a faith based in a proclamation that God sends his only son Jesus into the world, into our lives, to redeem and reclaim us as his children. It's faith that believes deep in our bones that God loves you and me just like he loves his son Jesus. He loves all of us as if each of us is the only child of love. His faith based in an understanding of ministry that is rooted in relationship and care that is not just professional and technical, but compassionate, empathetic, and relational. Because Morningside is based on faith like this, the orientation and movement is always toward a community of flourishing in which you and everyone around you are worthy of love and deserving of dignity and companions for this journey simply because you are the child of God. When the kids are grown up and moved away, when retirement comes, when our bodies begin to betray us, when spouses and friends decline or move away or die or all three of those, this assurance, this hope, this Promise may be called into question. Our worlds are rocked as we are confronted with our lives, with our own identity. And so much of what has formed and informed our lives falls away. We are so much more than the choices we make. But as someone has said, we make our choices and our choices make us. So we have a lot to think about, a lot to reflect on. And questions of meaning rise to the surface as we realize the distance we've traveled in life so far is a lot longer than the road still ahead. I recently reread an old book called Man's Search for Meaning. The author is Victor Frankl, a Jewish psychologist in Vienna who survived three years in Nazi concentration camps, including Auschwitz and Dachau. His pregnant wife, his parents, and his brother were all put on the same train at the same time with him, and all of them were exterminated in the camps. Prokhov wrote it in his book just nine, in just nine days, very soon after he was liberated by American troops. His original title for his book was A Psychologist's Experience at the Concentration Camp. But later, remarkably, he changed the title to Say yes to life in spite of everything. 
So it's got credibility. It's got credibility, and he makes my list of complaints and grievances seem very small and petty compared to what he endured. But from his horrible experiences came a whole system of therapy rooted in gratitude and in hope. In the camps, he came to believe that life was not primarily a quest for pleasure or for power, but a quest for meaning. He writes that this quest is not about defining the meaning of life, but about finding meaning in life. The life's work for all of us, Frankl says, is to find meaning not abstractly, but in the particulars of our life in our relationships. He identifies three sources for me. First, in work, whether it's a paying job or volunteering or a hobby, we find meaning in doing something that matters. Second, in love, giving of yourself to another or to others, caring deeply for someone desiring their well-being perhaps more than your own. Third, finding find meaning in courage in the face of suffering. He says suffering in and of itself is meaningless. Meaning is found in how we respond to it, how we learn to identify with the suffering of others. Directly pursuing things like happiness or success, he writes, will leave us empty, frustrated, and unfulfilled. These things are not to be pursued, but will only ensue when we seek to lead lives that are marked by meaningful work, meaningful love, and meaningful courage. We are promised by God that our lives do have meaning for now and always. Whatever season of life we are in, we have opportunities day by day to listen to our lives and look for the enduring meaning in them. Each day life invites us to live as a part of rather than a part from. Day by day we have chances to work and to love and to be brave. Others in and outside your community need your work, your love, your courage. You are needed. You have gifts to offer. You are not done. And the God who loves you is not done with you ever. I'll end with a movie ending that always chokes me up, tears me up. All that happens in the movie Saving Private Ryan is seen in a flashback of a rescued Private Ryan, now an old man, when he and his family visit the American cemetery at Normandy. He has returned for the first time to the place where so many died to save him. At the end, he kneels at the grave of Captain Miller, who led the soldiers on their rescue mission and died saving them. Ryan says as he faces the grave. I tried to live my best, live my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. His wife comes up beside him and he says to her, tell me I've led a good life. Tell me I'm a good man. And she says simply, you are. You are. And that, I think, is enough. Do good. Love generously and live bravely. Thank you. David, thank you for helping us say yes to life.
to literally the implication. She herself is a sparkling lady and member of the Morningside Meadows community, resident since 2014. Please help me warmly welcome Shelly Ross. Of the matters do the same. 
Richard Rohr always said that he tells people setting out on a walk to draw an imaginary line on the path ahead of them and then to tell themselves that as soon as they step over that line, they're going to see something marvelous. And they will. It might be the bark on a tree, or it could be a snail shell on the ground, or a bird feather, or a lovely leaf. But there's always something lovely to see. Once, last fall, in the middle of the drought, and with the canvas under construction so that there was not much room to explore, I saw a dead leaf on the sidewalk of heaven. A dead leaf. Yes. And it was marvelous. The sun was highlighting it from behind. It, it was all brown and curled, and yet the sun was shining on it and forming the sharp shadows that came out from the little peaks of the oak tree, oak leaf, where it came around. It was beautiful. And I thought that it was as if that little leaf, on her way to dust, still had her shiny moment on the stage. So I whipped out my phone and took a photo to paint later. It was marvelous. And then, just a few days ago, I was out walking near the building along Badcock by the flagpole. I looked up to see some leaves. They had great veins and curls that would be good for leaf printing in art. And I reached way up. Now, I knew I couldn't reach them. They were way too high, but maybe just to say hello. And I heard this voice call, this woman's voice call out, that's beautiful. I turned and looked, and there was a woman stuck in traffic, waiting for the light to change, hanging out her car window, looking at me. I answered, it's a beautiful day. Our eyes met, we smiled, the light changed, and then she was gone. And after that, my day was filled with light, and I hope hers was too. But I thought, two little specks of humanity in this great spiraling cosmos of ours. We are connected. We are connected. We are one. Another very important yes in my life is to friends. We are never isolated. We can choose time apart but we're always surrounded by friends. One is a friend of 80 years from when we were nine years old. Now we still talk on the phone a few minutes almost every day. She is in her home in Sugar Land and I'm in my home in the Meadows in, uh, in San Antonio. Other old good friends have come to the Meadows to live and be neighbors and friends there. And then we keep meeting new friends every day. Some friends we see daily as we eat meals with them. <coughs> Other friends we see almost daily. They're our employees and the staff who support and sustain our life and everything that we do. And still others, friends that we really like a lot, we see only seldom. But when we run into them, we stop and catch up. It's wonderful to live in the midst of so many compatible friends and neighbors. Bob and I feel our lives filled with gratitude for all the gifts of aging that we enjoy because we're privileged to live in this incredible community of Glen Side Ministries. But before we get too contented and self-absorbed, we can't help but remember those who cannot come to where we live on their own, on their 
own resources or maybe they can't stay there. But we are also grateful that there are many practical, helpful ways to aid those who need this financial help. And we are happy, Father and I, to be counted among those who support the outreach programs that Steve can tell us about. I want to close with a statement that I read in one of my many books. And I looked and looked for it. I can't find who wrote it or who said it. But authors often say something that I feel that I can't say with my words. And that's the case here. And this is the statement. I have never been so much in love with life as I am now. And never so little afraid. Awesome privilege of inviting to your support. Now, it's one point of this month, but it's not the point. And it's the point or what you just heard from Shelley, from Bishop Reed. And I think you heard, I hope you heard, this common thread of relationship and community and togetherness and flourishing. That's what Morningside offers people at all three of these communities. I'm the guy in the suit, paid to say that. Um, you heard it better from Shelley and David. And something in Shelley's talk um, made me think of uh, John Burroughs, an American naturalist. He said, uh, she was talking about the leaf. How beautiful the leaves grow old. How full of light and color are their last days. And I want you to know, if it's not clear, that this is available to everybody who lives in Morningside. Even if they don't have the resources to pay the full cost of care or living there. And you too can help them fill their last days with light and color. So, if I say, will you help? But that's, that's not how we want to do it. Now, um, it's important and it's urgent and you can make a difference, but this is really how we want to uh, offer you this opportunity. And I know, I know that so many of you in this room are already donors, regular donors, generous donors, sponsors. You've already made that commitment. Uh, but our thinking here is an opportunity for somebody who may be a guest of somebody else that likes what they heard, is moved or inspired. It wants to be part of this and help a resident live at Morningside and flourish at Morningside, even though they may not have all the resources they need to cover their, their care, their health care, their housing and living. And last year, 73 residents, you can't tell by looking at them, but 73 residents received some kind of uh, financial assistance, whether it was a uh, government fund, scholarship, or um, our subsidy of them in healthcare, nursing care, when uh, Texas Medicaid is uh, number 49 or 50 uh, in the state or in the country. This is important too. We don't want anybody to have to leave because they've run out of resources. They outlive their nest egg if they've been a good resident for a few years and a couple of other criteria. They get to stay, they get to keep the home that they love. And we gladly serve those in healthcare uh, who are Medicaid eligible. Not too many organizations are still doing that. As Pat mentioned uh, earlier, runs almost $2 million. And that works out to about $60 per day, on average, per resident who receives financial aid. $2 million sounds like a lot of money. Didn't expect you to have it in your pockets today, but perhaps as you're thinking about uh, helping us, helping a resident, you can see yourself maybe 
they sponsor every day at sixty dollars or two days at hundred and twenty or uh, even a month. Maybe somebody has a family foundation or a donor advised fund that uh, wants to do some tax savvy stock donations. I don't know. We just want to tell you what the need is and trust that if you're moved to help, you will. And make it easy. There's a little table tent there with a big QR code. So if you like doing newfangled things like that, you can scan that with your phone and make a gift online. Uh, if you like the old fangled way of writing a check, there's some envelopes, some gift cards, and some pens there too. Take the pen as our our parting gift to you. And if you want to do this, fill this out and make a gift. You can uh, give that to uh, to me or to Elena Clark. Raise your hand, Elena. There she is. Stand up. Robert Kessel, also in office, or anybody uh, on staff, and we'll make sure it gets put to good use right away. And uh, we'll thank you on behalf of those residents. On all those we are so blessed to serve, by Shelley and Bob, and so many amazing and fascinating residents here today. And it supports the work of the staff as well. Well, with that, I want to thank you again for joining us today and hearing some good stories and for supporting our work, even just to being aware of what Morningside offers. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your meal and your conversation. Safe drive home.